Hola, muy buenas noches. Sean bienvenidos a La Hoja del Olivo. En esta ocasión tenemos un invitado muy especial. Es Ben Spagman. Ben Spagman es un historiador santo de los últimos días y sus estudios abarcan las, las lenguas semíticas, los estudios bíblicos, eh, particularmente la historia de la ciencia y la historia del cristianismo. Y principalmente se centra en el desarrollo del pensamiento de la Reforma y la América Moderna en los Estados Unidos. Él es doctorante actualmente por la Universidad de Claremont, y eh, él explora el pensamiento de la Iglesia de Jesucristo de los Santos Últimos Días con respecto al cristianismo y la evolución. Él trata básicamente de cómo en el contexto de la cultura estadounidense eh, se pueden encontrar raíces sobre la forma en que se hace ex exégesis en la tradición sur sobre el pensamiento de la evolución o el antievolucionismo, el creacionismo, y en algunos supuestos hermenéuticos que a veces no reconocemos como parte de nuestra devoción religiosa o como parte de nuestra formación educativa y cultural. El Benjamin Speckman eh, fue uno de los becados por la Universidad de Yucta para Estudios Mormones en 2022-23, y... Este, él está participando en su tesis doctorante en la, Universidad de Gradu en la Universidad de Claremont en el Departamento de Graduados y su proyecto se titula Las raíces intelectuales del conflicto entre la creación y la evolución de los santos últimos días en el siglo XX experiencia, exégesis y eclesiología y brinda un análisis histórico del conflicto entre los defensores santos de los últimos días de creacionismo y la evolución como un estudio de caso en la producción del conocimiento religioso, el conflicto epistemológico y la competencia por la autoridad sociocultural. Es decir, a lo largo del siglo XX, diferentes científicos, académicos y líderes de la Iglesia Sud, así como escritores que también son miembros de la Iglesia, compitieron por reclamar la autoridad, la interpretación escritural, la explicación científica y plantear sus posiciones como marcadamente contrastantes con respecto a la posibilidad de la evolución biológica. Esas posiciones surgieron de diferentes construcciones que tuvieron que ver con la comprensión, con el desarrollo de la, del conocimiento de la ciencia en la iglesia, con la forma en que vemos las escrituras y con la forma en que las interpretamos. Entonces, su trabajo abarca todos este, esos elementos y al poder nosotros analizar cómo hemos llegado a comprender la, la evolución como iglesia, podemos también comprender algunos de nuestros fundamentos epistemológicos y teólogos en ese proceso de formación personal. Y te damos muchas gracias, Benjamin, por estar con nosotros y aceptar esta invitación para el público en español. Eh, nos apoyará Ari Dávila en la interpretación de de esta presentación y le damos el tiempo a Javier Fuentes para que inicie con algunas preguntas. Eh, el pensamiento santo de los últimos días eh, con respecto a la forma en que la tierra y la humanidad han llegado a ser y existir ha variado desde su aparición eh, en el año 1830 hasta nuestros días. ¿Qué nos puede decir un poco sobre esto, Ben? So Ben, what can you tell us about the way the earth has varied or changed um, since the 1830s to our time um, in regards to the Latter-day Saints? Okay, that... yeah. So as I understand it, the question is, how have Latter-day Saints thought about the earth creation and right. science since the 1800s. Correct. And the, the short answer is it's changed a lot and there have been lots of different ways of thinking about it, even among general authorities. And that diversity of thought suggests, as the church has said very bluntly in recent years, that there is no, uh, there is no fixed doctrine on this. There's no revelation on this per se. Scripture is not a revelation of science. If we go back to Joseph Smith in the 1830s, uh, 
one of the things that we should understand is that uh, science at that point was not what we think of today. Science in the 1800s was being invented as we think of it today. That is in the 1800s, science became something you did as a job, a, a career. It became something technical. Uh, it involved a lot of math, a lot of measuring. It became something specialized. That is in the past, in the 1500s and the 1600s, you might be a wealthy man and you had interest in air pumps and rocks and mountains and animals and you'd kind of do all these things because you had the money and the time to explore them and in the 1800s that all changed and you could be a professional chemist you could be a professional geologist and so when joseph smith is born in 1805 uh, there is a lot that had been learned about the earth in the last 200 years from the 1600s but there was a lot that was about to be discovered in the next 150 years or so. Um, even things like uh, if you if you grab a five year old today, uh, maybe a 10 year old and say, where do babies come from? They can tell you about sperm and egg and, and things like that. That was not even understood until the 1880s. Um, things that we take as very basic information was not understood until the late 1800s. So um, Joseph Smith thought about the earth and creation, mostly like other people in his environment. Uh, and as he got revelation on it, that may or may not have changed much. But many people in the 1800s, when they opened the Bible, they thought that the fact that the Bible was inspired meant that it was a fairly simple recording of uh, natural philosophy is the older term natural science or as we would say science it was just a history of the earth it was the same thing that scientists would tell you god had just told it to you this way and so people look to scripture to understand the nature of the world around them in various different ways by the time of brigham young um mid 1800s, late 1800s, a lot of those changes around science had started taking place. Uh, Darwin wrote his first book in 1859, and, and uh, it took a while for that to come over to the United States. But Darwinism and evolution was not really a big deal yet. Um, once you get into the 1900s, and science is professional, and uh, very heavily attached to universities, which are engaging in research. Universities didn't always do that. It used to be that universities were primarily responsible for training uh, priests in theology, which was the most difficult PhD you could do. And in the early 1900s, American universities started switching to this new German model, which involved research and finding new knowledge and refining old knowledge instead of merely teaching the tradition. And so in the 1900s, all of a sudden, we start pushing back the age of the Earth. In the 1800s, people had thought that the Earth was old, not just a few thousand years old, but generally they did think it was several hundred thousand years old, maybe a few million years old. They weren't sure yet. They didn't have good methods yet. But by the early 1900s, science was pushing the Earth back millions and millions of years, if not more. Uh, particularly through geology. Um, and in the early 1900s, you get a string of discoveries related to our topic tonight, not only about geology, but also about the universe, just how big the universe was, how many stars and things there were, how far away they were, how old the Earth was. And uh, then in the 1930s, you get a couple of very interesting things. Um, the idea of evolution existed before Darwin. Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, actually wrote poetry about evolution. What Darwin did was he gave a explanation for how evolution might be happening. And from Darwin's time until about the 1930s, more and more scientists were accepting evolution 
but for a variety of reasons, they weren't sure that Darwin's explanation made sense. Uh, and that would be natural selection is what Darwin came up with. And then the 1930s, thanks to population uh, genetics and uh, genetics itself, and the rediscovery of the research of the Polish monk Gregor Mendel, who was the guy who discovered the rules of inheritance. If you've ever done biology, you've probably had to do Punnett squares and all of this stuff comes together and they go, oh, wow, Darwin's ideas really make sense. And then 10 years later, they discovered DNA, uh, late 1940s. And all of a sudden, all these things come together and say the earth is extremely old. Animals have been living and dying on it for a long time, coming into existence, going extinct. We can tell they're related because of their DNA. Um, and science just explodes. In the mid 1900s, you also have this huge growth of Latter day Saint scientists. Um, in the early 1900s, a lot of church leaders had scientific training or were very favorable to science. And there's this boom of LDS scientists in the 1950s and 60s getting PhDs in all kinds of fields. Um, and this is really where conflict starts happening um, because we have trained scientists accepting the data and we have some church leaders who reject the data because of how they read scripture. And then we have church leaders who are scientists who are trying to balance these two and figure out how they mesh somehow. Um, and uh, what the church has said most recently, and I am not sure if these are available in Spanish, but in 2016, in the New Era, which was the magazine for teenagers, there were two articles. There was one called, What Does the Church Believe About Dinosaurs? And it said, dinosaurs existed long, long ago. <laughs> I didn't, it's too funny thing. Dinosaurs existed. They died millions of years ago. We don't know how they relate to Adam and Eve and the garden and the fall, but they're old. Uh, there was a similar article called What Does the Church Believe About Evolution? And it said, we don't have any revelation on evolution. It's taught at church schools. That's about the extent of it. So it's changed a lot as we have gotten more science to wrestle with. And also now, I think, uh, as we have gotten better understandings of scripture. Anyway, that's that's long. <laughs> that's a lot. Sí, este, ¿cómo es que después del surgimiento de la teoría de la evolución, como has mencionado, cómo es que influyen B.H. B. H. Roberts, J.C. Talma, Joseph F. Smith en nuestras concepciones acerca del origen del hombre? So how the B. H. Robert, James E. Thomage, Joseph F. Smith influence on our conception about the origin of man. So I know this story very well. And sometimes people I talk to are familiar with this story. And sometimes they don't know who these people are at all. So how much detail would you like here? Mm -hmm. Should I should I assume that people have probably not heard of B. H. Roberts? Because he tends to not be very well known. Okay. If you could, if, right, if you could introduce the topic for those who don't have Okay, it. okay. So in the late 1920s and early 1930s, there were uh, several apostles who had PhDs in science. There was James E. Talmadge, who was a PhD in geology. There was John Witzo, who had a PhD in chemistry. Uh, by 1933, you had uh, Elder Merrill, who had a PhD in physics, but I guess he comes after this. There was also a member of the 70, he was one of the presidency of the 70, named Brigham H. Roberts. B.H. Roberts is how he went. And the interesting thing about Roberts is that uh, he read voraciously, he read everything. When he was a mission president in New York, he liked to uh, change out of his mission president clothes and go down and stand on the street corner and debate with people. That was, that was his approach to life. And while he was in New York, he spent a lot of time in the library doing research. Um, the first presidency hired him to do research and write a book. And this book 
was kind of his uh, his magnum opus. It was it was his final great work, and he was trying to unify science and religion and scripture and the gospel and and just bring everything together. And his book was controversial. There we go. It was called The Truth, the Way, and the Life, quoting Jesus. And uh, the reason why this was controversial is as he tried to square what they understood of science with scripture, he argued that um, the earth was very old and fossils were also very old and probably came from uh, an earlier version of creation. Uh, this is an idea that was not unique to B.H. Roberts. This was an idea that was very much in the air at the time. It was one way of making sense of the early chapters of Genesis. Um, in English, this is called the ruin and restoration theory. Uh, it has it goes by a couple of names, the gap theory. Uh, and, and in this model, um, there would have been a creation and civilizations which were destroyed and then God created again. And so fossils belong to this earlier creation on this earth. And Roberts wrote this in his manuscript. And when he submitted it to the first presidency or, or the reading committee for review, they said, well, hold on, we're not sure about this. And um, Joseph Fielding Smith, who was a young apostle at the time, he had real problems with it. Uh, the root of the problem, the root of the disagreement between these church leaders was in a couple of different assumptions. One was the nature of scripture. One was how you read scripture. And the third one was how is scripture related to the world around us? In other words, how do the things that we discover about the world around us, how should those affect our understanding of scripture? And for Joseph Fielding Smith, because scripture was inspired, it was simple factual truth from God, not only doctrinal truth, but also truths of geology and biology and physics. Sí, un momento. Sí, este, creo que parte de ese conflicto tiene de trasfondo la forma en que ellos interpretaban el discurso de Kim Foley, la reinterpretación de B. H. Roberts sobre ese discurso y el conflicto que causaba su publicación en la iglesia puede ser parte del origen de, del conflicto entre esas dos autoridades. So there were two authorities that created a conflict, uh, which were who, Javier? The two authorities that were creating the conflict. What Juan mentioned is like, uh, that maybe a, one cause of the problem may be the interpretation of the King Fowler discourse from Joseph Smith. And probably that's why they were having these disagreements between uh, B.H. Roberts and Joseph Finney Smith. What do you think about that? Uh, that may have been a factor. Um, I don't, I don't remember that particularly, or at least that's not, that's not an aspect that my research has focused on, but it's been a while since I looked at that part. Uh, one, of, one of the problems, and Joseph Fielding Smith knew this in particular, is that there was no single King Follett discourse. That is, um, what they had was notes from different people that were then kind of put together and then they filled in the gaps because that's how people wrote history in the 1800s. Uh, so if you have read the King Fall the King Follett discourse, uh, what you're reading is a, a combination, an amalgamation. You're not reading the actual words of Joseph Smith. You're reading a reconstruction. Uh, and that means that people can get different things out of it depending on whose notes you read. Um, I think the Joseph Smith papers goes into this, but I haven't, I haven't looked at it much. But at least, at least with going back to B. H. Roberts' manuscript, Joseph Fielding Smith bluntly said, "Look, if you believe that there was death before Adam six thousand years ago, then 
you are rejecting scripture, you are rejecting prophets, you're rejecting the temple, you are rejecting everything. And B.H. Roberts said, I'm not doing that at all. And so this manuscript uh, went up before the Quorum of the Twelve. Uh, and the Quorum of the Twelve spent a good bit of time reading it. Now, meanwhile, Joseph Fielding Smith gave a very public talk in which he took aim at B.H. Roberts and tried to say, if you believe the earth is old, if you believe there was any death of anything before Adam 6,000 years ago, then you are apostate. Uh, and that did not help. That kind of inflamed the situation. Well, the short version is the Quorum of the Twelve read B.H. Roberts' manuscript, and they invited him to give a defense of himself, which he did at length. And they invited Joseph Fielding Smith to present his views, and he wrote them out. It was a very long paper. It must have taken several hours to read. And then the Quorum of the Twelve said, you know what? This is beyond us. We're going to ask the First Presidency to weigh in here. And what is very interesting and not very well known today is that the First Presidency, uh, they refused to say if Roberts was right or Joseph Fielding Smith was right. They bluntly said, the church has no doctrinal position on men before Adam. We're not saying if they existed. We're not saying they didn't exist. We don't know. The second thing they said that was very interesting was the church has no doctrine on death before the fall. We have no doctrine on that. I'm sorry for these animations. I'm not sure how they're happening. I'm not touching any keys. Um, <laughs> Uh, but then they said something else very interesting. And this essentially lined up with the position of James E. Talmadge and John Witzow and uh, Roberts. They said, leave science to the scientists. It is not our mission to do biology or geology or anthropology. Our mission is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that was an implicit rebuke to Joseph Fielding Smith because in essence they said, you can't get science out of scripture. Science is not teaching scripture in any way. Uh, so they didn't take anyone's position, but in terms of their paradigm or framework of how they thought about these things, they lined up with James E. Talmadge and Witzow and Roberts. And so to provide public balance, because Joseph Fielding Smith had given this very strong talk, they allowed James E. Talmadge to give a public talk called Earth and Man. And in that, he said, the earth is old. Life and death have been going on for millions of years. We don't know how to make sense of all this stuff, but those are facts that we accept. And science can teach us about this stuff. And God is inspiring science. And the church officially printed his talk, Earth and Man, as an official church pamphlet. They distributed 20,000 copies. They had it translated into German for the saints in Germany. They had it printed in England. It was everywhere. Um, and so public balance was kind of preserved that way. And Joseph Fielding Smith's response was to write on his copy of that pamphlet, Earth and Man, false doctrine. Now, the reason that he determined that was false doctrine, in spite of the arguments, in spite of the first presidency, was because for him, scripture was very clear. And for the first presidency and the others, they said, no, scripture is not clear at all. And especially where scripture seems to contradict what well-established science says, we should not be quick to claim what scripture says. And the problem was Joseph Fielding Smith thought you read scripture at face value in translation without any kind of context, and you will understand what God intended to tell Moses or Isaiah or Paul 2000 years ago. That is how he read scripture. He thought it was just plain and simple. And anyone who disagreed with him was rejecting scripture. He didn't think he was interpreting. Other people interpreted, he was not. Of course, everyone interprets. Everyone brings assumptions to scripture, but they didn't recognize the assumptions they had. <clears throat> 
So that was that was the story. And the first presidency, they put out that memo that said, leave science to the scientists. And they told them all, don't talk about this stuff in public anymore. And that was more or less followed for about 20 years. Yo tengo nada más una pregunta. Fue por 20 años hasta que Josephine Smith llegó a la presidencia de la iglesia. ¿O qué fue lo que cambió? So what, what made the difference after those 20 years was it until Joseph Smith field went to the presidency or what made No, difference? what happened is um, basically uh, everyone who had been in church leadership in 1931 died except for Joseph Fielding Smith and David O. McKay and uh, J. Reuben Clark. So the apostles who got called in the 1940s and 1950s, I don't think they were aware of this memo, but they had been raised on Joseph Fielding Smith's books and talks. And so it's in uh, 1953, I think, that um, uh, Harold B. Lee, if I remember correctly, gives a general conference talk in which he talks about pre-atomites or evolution or something like that. So uh, the question is, what did new apostles get told about this topic? I suspect they didn't get told anything um, just because of the way the church was organized at the time. Um, uh, there's a lot of change in church leadership in the 1940s and 50s. To illustrate that, Harold B. Lee gets called as an apostle in 1941, I believe. And by 1954, 13 years later, he is the senior apostle after Joseph Fielding Smith, who is next in line after David O. McKay. Uh, everyone else in those 13 years either died or there was one excommunication of an apostle. So there's almost complete turnover between 1941 and 1953, 1954. It's a new set of church leaders who don't know anything about what happened in 1930, 1931, with the exception of Joseph Fielding Smith, who thought the first presidency made the wrong decision. David O. McKay, who didn't leave much of a paper trail about this, uh, and J. Reuben Clark. And, and notably, J. Reuben Clark disagreed with Joseph Fielding Smith on a bunch of this stuff. Este, en español, la posición que generalmente conocemos es la de Joseph Fielding Smith a través del manual de instituto de los años 80. Este manual es profundamente antievolucionista y ha marcado una especie de doctrina oficial para el mundo de habla hispana. Eh, Sabemos que Joseph Fielding Smith era un firme creyente en la tierra joven y un antievolucionista. ¿Cómo fue que esto llegó a nuestro currículum? ¿Y qué podemos decirle a los santos de los últimos días de habla hispana? Eh, ¿Qué es el estado de, del arte en estos momentos? So what can we tell the Spanish LDS uh, members about? Because what they know of is from the 30s of uh, Joseph Fielding Smith in the Institute Manual. Um, so what can you tell the um, Spanish speaker LDS in relation to this? Okay. Um... To really tell this story, we have to go back to 1926. Uh, and I'll try to move through it quickly. But um, so uh, in the United States in 1925, there was a famous trial called the Scopes trial in Tennessee. It was about evolution and teaching evolution in high schools. And it got massive coverage from newspapers and radio and uh, There were thousands of people who went to this tiny town to go outside the courthouse for this trial. And um, there was a lot of interest in evolution. The church got asked for their position. They put out a new first presidency statement in 1925 about it, uh, which most people don't know. 
And um, at this trial, there was a man who was named as a scientist who supported the idea of a young earth. That man was named George McCready Price. He is not well known except among historians. Price was a Seventh-day Adventist. He had a high school education and based on the visions of Ellen White, the founder of Seventh-day Adventism, he had studied geology on his own and had started writing books saying that all the mountains and valleys on the earth and all the fossils were created during the flood, uh, you know, 3000 BC. And he united science and scripture this way. And he wrote a bunch of books about it. And uh, in 1926, Joseph Fielding Smith starts reading George McCready Price's science books. Now, they weren't actually science books. People who were trained in geology said, these are awful. They start with bad assumptions, they have bad data, and they have bad conclusions. There was one geology professor who used to assign them to his students as kind of a, how many mistakes can you find kind of thing. But because George McCready Price started with the same assumption as Joseph Fielding Smith, namely, true science is found in scripture because true science is revealed by God, Joseph Fielding Smith really liked his work. And so in 1926, he's trying to get other apostles to read George McCready Price's books. And John Witso writes him a letter and he says very kindly, these are garbage. But in 1931, in the argument with B.H. Roberts and the long paper he writes, he quotes George McCready Price for nine pages to prove that mainstream science is wrong about geology. And uh, even though Talmadge and Witso both bring in all kinds of scientific authorities to say, no, he's not a scientist. He's not only is he not right, he's not even a scientist. No one respects this guy. This is fundamentalism masquerading as science. The first presidency accepts that, but Joseph Fielding Smith doesn't. And so here's what happens. James E. Talmadge dies in 1933. Uh, B.H. Roberts also dies about that time. John Witso dies in 1953. And when John Witso dies, he is the last scientist in the quorum. And although another scientist, Henry Eyring, is nominated to replace him, ultimately Eyring isn't called. And at that point in 1953, with no scientists in the quorum, all of a sudden there's no one pushing back on Joseph Fielding Smith anymore in the quorum from a position of scientific and ecclesiastical authority. And at that point, Joseph Fielding Smith takes this manuscript that he has worked on for a couple decades, which draws heavily on George McCready Price and other people who are following Price's work. And he publishes it on his own. He does not run it past the church committee. This book is called Man, His Origin and Destiny. And at this point, there are younger apostles in the quorum who think that uh, Smith has the right approach. Back in 1931, not only had the first presidency voted against Joseph Fielding Smith, there were only three apostles who stood with him. So it was very much a minority position. But by 1954, it's no longer a minority, and there are no scientists in the quorum to say, this isn't science. This isn't good reasoning. And so he publishes it, and it gets uh, a lot of press, uh, including in the church news, um, from Elder Marty Peterson, who was a journalist. And he says, this is an expert book of science and theology, and every college student should read it. And in the summer of 1954, Elder Harold B. Lee, who, as I had mentioned, was now uh, third in seniority, he is in charge of leading what's called the summer school at BYU. And all BYU religion professors, all professional seminary and institute teachers travel to BYU for several weeks for advanced courses in theology under Elder Lee and a few other apostles. And Elder Lee assigns them all to read Man, His Origin, and Destiny. He makes them write a paper on it. 
He preaches from it repeatedly. He holds up George McCready Price as a well-established scientist respected in his field. I wonder if it's somehow, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> And uh, he brings in President Smith, uh, who is the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, to lecture because there have been so many questions about this book. And so he comes in and gives several lectures and he does several hours of questions and answers, which we have the text of. And someone asks him bluntly, well, OK, so you think the Earth is very young? And he says, yes, I am not interpreting. I am just relating to you what the Lord has revealed. And I said, well, OK, but other general authorities think differently. What is our responsibility as church employees? And Elder Smith says, if you're not on board with this, you have no business teaching for the church. So he basically says, this is orthodoxy. This is the scriptural position. And uh, some people quit. Some people go talk to President McKay. And President McKay says, no, 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 this is not church doctrine. If I had known that Elder Lee was going to assign this, I would have stopped them. Um, he sends, apparently, J. Reuben Clark down to BYU to give his famous talk called uh, When Are the Words of Church Leaders Entitled to the Claim of Scripture, which has been published in several places, several church manuals. That's a very subtle pushback on Joseph Fielding Smith. Um, so subtle that I don't think the public understands it. Uh, because President Clark, he doesn't say anything about the age of the earth. He doesn't say anything about evolution. He doesn't say anything about science. He doesn't say anything about Joseph Fielding Smith. President McKay sends uh, the junior apostle, Adam Benyon, who had replaced Witso, down to BYU to their geology department to tell the geology department, this is not church doctrine. This is only his opinion. Don't let anyone who is fundamentalist like that try to affect you on campus. There is uh, a lot of letters written by scientists to President McKay where they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're familiar with James E. Talmadge and John Witso and Earth and Man and all that stuff. But now Elder Smith is teaching this at BYU and writing this book. Has church doctrine, is this now church doctrine? And in every single case, President McKay writes a letter to say, this is his opinion only. It is not church doctrine. We do not have any doctrine on this. But he doesn't do anything publicly. He does nothing publicly. Y privadamente. And in private. In private, he does all of these things. The BYU professors know, some of the CES people know, anyone who writes him a letter knows. But what the public has is they have the glowing recommendation from the church news. They have these CES people coming home from BYU saying, Elder Smith says this is the church position and this is what scripture teaches. And I'm supposed to teach this as part of my employment for the church. And I think because President McKay, he had a very, he had such a kind personality that he did not like conflict. He did not like head-to-head -head conflict. And um, there is uh, a different thing later on where, uh, oh, this is with Mormon doctrine in 1957, where he assigns uh, Marky e. Peterson to write a public rebuke to Elder McConkie in Mormon doctrine to publicly say, this is not the church's position. This is a very problematic book. And Joseph Fielding Smith prevails upon... Sí, un momentito para nuestros yeah. escuchas de la, la Hoja del Olivo. Le recordamos que tenemos precisamente un podcast sobre el, el libro de Mormon Doctrine de Bruce R. McConkie, donde hablamos precisamente de las observaciones que hizo el Leonard Peterson y las correcciones que se hicieron para este libro o las razones por las que la Iglesia recomendó que no se presentara como doctrina de la Iglesia o se recomendara su publicación. They, just, they had a pod, podcast specifically on that topic. Okay. okay. Yeah. So uh, President McKay never does anything publicly. And so what the public hears is, this is a great book. This solves the problems between science and religion. President Smith uh, 
is well studied in these areas, and the reality is he was not. He was reading George McCready Price and other creationists who were claiming true science starts with the Bible. Um, and so from 1954, that, that snowballs, that spreads. And so for, uh, say, young people who are joining the church education system in 1956 as new seminary teachers, this is just what they're being taught. And it makes sense to them because this is a very, uh, this is a very populist way of uniting scripture and science. It's one of the reasons creationism has power because it says you don't need those experts. You don't need Bible scholars with Hebrew and context and history to tell you what the Bible meant 3000 years ago. And you don't need expert scientists. You can just read scripture and you can look at the world around you and you can see that evolution is a satanic falsehood. Cats don't give birth to dogs. Monkeys don't give birth to people. It's simple. So it's powerful because it's simple, because it's populist, because it cuts out the experts. Um, and so by the, by the 1970s, there is a lot of conflict at BYU because on the one hand, BYU has very strong programs in uh, the soft sciences like anthropology and history, but it is also very strong in genetics and biology and even evolutionary biology. And they all have legitimate PhDs from strong schools. And you have the religion department which has people who do not have PhDs. If they do, they're probably from BYU. Um, they are people who were raised on Joseph Fielding Smith's books. And so what happens in the 1970s is you have the scientists trying to teach the science and saying, the church has no position on this. And you have the religion professors at BYU and some CES people saying, the scientists at BYU are atheists, they're communists. They're rejecting the gospel. They're rejecting the teachings of Joseph Fielding Smith and students get caught in this crossfire. And this brings us to that 1980 Institute Manual. Who writes the Institute Manuals? It is people who are drawn from the church education system. And in the case of this manual, my research in the, the church archives and BYU archives uh, has turned up, I, I know exactly who wrote it. I know exactly who approved it. Uh, I have seen the, the worksheets of who's assigned to what section. Uh, and I have a long post about this on my blog that goes into detail. But the, the, uh, the man who wrote the Genesis section, largely thanks to Joseph Fielding Smith's influence, was very much reading Seventh-day Adventist science. He was, he subscribed to Seventh-day Adventist magazines. He subscribed to creationist literature. And for him, he thought evolution was so easy to disprove. He couldn't believe any real scientist would accept evolution. It was so obviously wrong. And it's because he was not a scientist. He was getting his science from fundamentalists who also were not for the most part scientists. And, um, in 1972 at BYU, uh, Elder Oaks was the new president of BYU, and Elder Oaks is aware of this war between the departments, and he says, we need peace for the sake of the students. And so he tries to bring the scientists and the religion people together, and the guy who wrote the Institute Manual quits, kind of out of protest. He says, I did not realize that so many professors at BYU were were secularists and naturalists and atheists. BYU has been lost to Babylon. Uh, he used very strong rhetoric, extremely strong rhetoric. And so he leaves BYU, but he stays in the church education system. And he gets asked to be the primary writer of Genesis for the Institute Manual. And so for him, because true science starts with scripture, and true scientists start with scripture, what he looks to for his sources are things like Seventh-day Adventists and people in that vein. If you look in the early section of the Institute Manual on Genesis, you will find a quotation from a Seventh-day Adventist creationism pamphlet that's about 2,000 words long. I think it's four columns of text. There is nothing from 
faithful LDS geologists like James E. Talmadge, or Talmadge's son, Sterling Talmadge, who was also a PhD in geology. There's nothing about the age of the earth from John Witzo. It is, there's nothing from the first presidency. Um, there is Seventh-day Adventism. There is a reference to a man named Emmanuel Velikovsky, who was not a fundamentalist. He was a secular Jewish psychiatrist from Russia and Israel who thought that, um, uh, he was very secular, but he thought the Bible was just history. And all of the miracles in the Old Testament were just eyewitnesses of miracles. And furthermore, these miracles were natural miracles. They weren't God waving his hand. They were things happening that caused stuff. And he decided to go do research in other civilizations' history to prove this. And so he starts writing books in the 1950s that argued, for example, that the cause of the flood was that, uh, I will try to get these details correct from memory, they're probably a little fuzzy, but essentially the planet Jupiter had ejected a massive comet that had passed by the Earth, it had tilted the Earth's axis, it had caused all kinds of magnetic and uh, meteorological and other massive things, and this caused the flood. And that led to seasons, and uh, furthermore, this, this massive comet had passed by the Earth again, which were the, uh, the plagues in Egypt. And this massive comet had eventually settled into orbit as Venus. And moreover, all of these other civilizations in Mexico and China, they also had witnessed this, and it was in their records. And all of that sounds great, except to make that argument, he had to throw out physics. All of the astronomers and physicists said, this is really bad astronomy. This is really bad physics. All of the historians of Mexican history and Chinese history and Egyptian history said, this is bad history. This is not right. The data is wrong. The interpretations are bad. Uh, and so Velikovsky's books were complete garbage. And they sold like crazy in America. People loved them. He wrote multiple books. Um, Velikovsky is kind of the inventor of pseudoscience in America, modern pseudoscience. There's a, a good book on that in English. And Velikovsky gets quoted in the Institute Manual in 1980, as if he's a, a valid authority. Um, and then it quotes Joseph Fielding Smith that you have to choose an effect between Jesus and evolution. Now, let's set aside the fact that this was not the ruling of the first presidency. This had not been the ruling of the first presidency in 1931. There was no revelation on this. This was a minority view. But because of how Joseph Fielding Smith had taught and those views had spread, they became dominant among CES. So they got written into the manual. And then the first level of review of the manual was also by CES people who were also in this paradigm. Um, and so the manual gets published and other CES people and professors at BYU and people all over the world who are now getting this translated into their own language for the first time, I'll go, whoa, what? This is not the church's position. This has never been the church's position. How are we now suddenly declaring this in the Institute Manual? Um, and so that's, that's the very long story of the Institute Manual. Uh, uh, my dissertation goes into this in great depth. Uh, and so I know this story very well. Um, I know of uh, the mission president in Italy after this was published, uh, the first day he showed up at the office as mission president, one of the local Italian women who worked at the office came to him with this new institute manual and said, is this what the church really expects us to believe? Because this is, this is not what scripture seems to say. This is not what science says. And I haven't heard this before. And he spent a lot of time in Italy trying to do damage control. Um, so in essence, this in a nutshell boils down to when that manual got written and published, it was very selective about the church authorities it decided to quote. And by choosing to quote only one side, 
they portrayed the church's position misleadingly as if it were one thing when in reality it was not that at all. Um, so that's the story of the Institute Manual, which for reasons I do not understand remains our current Institute Manual 45 years later. I don't know of any other manual in the church that is 45 years old. Um, now I want to balance that uh, with some other data that most people will not be aware of. Um, David O. McKay was president of the church from 1951 until 1970. And when he died, he was replaced by Joseph Fielding Smith. While he was president of the church, Joseph Fielding Smith said nothing about evolution. And while David O. McKay was president of the church, he did several things that were pro-evolution because he accepted evolution. Um, for example, in general conference in 1965, five or 66, I believe. He talks about a book he's been reading on Genesis by a non LDS scholar. And he quotes this book. And the part of the book he quotes talks about how when Genesis is describing Adam and Eve choosing whether or not to eat the fruit, that represents the point in human evolution where we could resist our impulses. Animals can't resist our impulses. But at some point, we developed the capacity to say, I am hungry, I do not eat. I am thirsty, I do not drink. I want that fruit, I will choose not to eat it. David O. McKay taught that in General Conference. That is evolutionary. Also in the 1960s, the uh, magazine committee decided to run a series of articles by prominent LDS scientists, some of them pertaining to the age of the earth, which they argued was old, and there was one about evolution. It said that evolution is real. You need to be trained in biology to understand evolution and have a valid opinion as to whether it actually happened or not. Uh, it went into great detail about this. Now, this magazine article was reviewed by the normal people in the church and it went all the way up to President McKay and President McKay read it, reviewed it and made no changes to it. And unusually when it was printed, it came with a little heading that said, this article has been reviewed by the editor of the magazine. And if you go back to the front, the editor of the magazine, it says is President McKay. Now, President McKay was not trying to establish that as doctrine. He wasn't claiming it as revelation, but he thought that that was the best information they had, and he wanted it printed. And notably, when that magazine article came out, Joseph Fielding Smith and some other people were, were furious about it. They thought it was teaching false doctrine, but the president of the church had put his stamp of approval on it. Most people are not aware of those articles or the history behind them. Uh, most people don't read general conference talks from the 1960s, you know, or go say, oh, well, he mentioned this book. Let me go read that book and see what it says. Wow, this is a book trying to say Genesis is talking about evolution. Now, I don't think that's correct. I don't think Genesis is talking about evolution. It's also not arguing against it. That's a different topic. But uh, McKay was pro-evolution. He encouraged it. He subtly taught it. He didn't establish it as church doctrine, but that was his view. That was his opinion. Bueno, este, mi pregunta es, ¿por qué ahora es importante para los santos los últimos días tener un conocimiento más amplio de la composición, el simbolismo, las leyendas, la narrativa e intereses de los escritores en las escrituras? Tanto al abordar el tema como el origen del hombre o el origen de la tierra. So why is it important for the Latter-day Saints to have a broader knowledge um, of the composition and symbolism, legend, narrative, and interest of the writers in the scriptures when addressing the subject of the origin of men on the earth? This is a great question. And um... you know, Latter-day Saints, are not a unified culture. Uh, 
Latter-day Saints in Utah are different from Latter-day Saints where I grew up, are different from Latter-day Saints in France where I served my mission, are different from Latter-day Saints in England. Uh, and I assume Latter-day Saints in Mexico are different from Latter-day Saints in Uruguay and so on. Um, but at least among many Latter-day Saints in English-speaking United States, we inherited a way of reading scripture that was binary. Things were literal or they were figurative. And neither of those words came with definitions. And for many people, what literal meant was it's history. It really happened this way. It's accurate history. And moreover, I can read it at face value. That is, I don't need any context. I don't need any cultural explanations. I don't need a better translation. Um, and the, the interesting thing about that is, regardless of where you live, that's not how you read anything else. When you pick up a book, it's important for you to know what kind of book it is, because what kind of book it is tells you how you should understand the information. Um, trying to think of a good example off the top of my head. Um, if you pick up a book uh, and you open it up and you find a recipe, it's important for you to know if it's a cookbook from a chef or if, say, it's the last half of a fictional novel and the recipe is for poison to kill someone. Now, for most of us, we could figure that out pretty quickly, picking up a book, right? Um, but occasionally, uh, we might read a book or go to a movie and we go in thinking it's one kind of thing. And then halfway through, something happens and we go, oh, wait, this isn't a realistic fiction movie because uh, I just saw ghosts. This guy is seeing ghosts and ghosts aren't real. So this is a fiction movie, not a history movie. Um, we call these genres. Um, and I don't, I don't know how it is in Spanish, but at least in, in French and English, this, this goes back to a Latin word that means, you know, kind of thing, right? Uh, if, you, if you read a newspaper, which nobody does anymore, but, you know, when you get on a news site, you'll note that there are different kinds of articles. Um, but I'm going to stick with newspapers because I think a lot of people know newspapers. When you open up a newspaper, you are going to get different kinds of information. And how you process the words you read is going to depend on, are you reading it in a news story? Are you reading it in the opinion section? Or are you reading it in the comic section, the cartoon section? Um, at least in American newspapers, there used to be a cartoon called Doonesbury, which was about uh, a guy who had been in the army and was now returned, but sometimes went back. And so in theory, you could have picked up a newspaper in the 1990s and you could have read a rock war, both in the news section and the opinion section, but also the cartoon section. And how you process that information depended on what section it was in. And you would decide what kind of information it was in based on things like, are there pictures? Are they hand drawn? Does it have a big heading saying opinion? Is it on the front page? Every culture, presents information with what we call genre markers. They're the little things that tell you how to take the information. Now, the problem is that genre markers, they're something you learn by growing up in a culture. Um, in English with fairy tales, they tend to start with once upon a time. In French, you know, il était une fois. Um, if you encounter fairies or wizards, that's a marker of a certain kind of genre. If there are spaceships and laser battles, that's a certain kind of genre. You don't open up a book and go, is this book literal or figurative? I, I sometimes like to ask my institute students, is Star Wars literal or figurative? And they all kind of go, I don't think that applies. And I say, well, why not? Well, it's more complicated than that. And I say, okay, if it's more complicated than that, why isn't scripture more complicated than that? Why don't we recognize that ancient scripture, ancient authors, 
had different genres they wrote in. And when I say genre, I refer to both form and content. So Paul writes letters, that's their form. But in those letters, he also uses specific kinds of Greco-Roman rhetoric, um, uh, particular genres of argument. In the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament, we have parables. We recognize parables pretty easily. Um, sometimes Jesus says, hear this parable. That's a nice label on the genre, right? But even when Jesus doesn't label it, we're familiar enough with parable that we go, oh, this is a parable, which means it's a short, kind of realistic, fictional story that has some kind of message or lesson. That is how we should take this information because it's the genre of parable. Well, we have a lot of different genres in the Old Testament. Uh, and the problem is because we are not native Israelites, we don't recognize those genres. We tend to assume it's all history, unless it's really obvious it's not history. And then we suddenly go, oh, well, that part's figurative. And this is really, uh, this is really flattening scripture. This is treating scripture like it's black and white instead of dozens or hundreds of colors. Um, maybe you've seen those videos on YouTube of people who are colorblind and they put on special glasses and all of a sudden they can see color and they're so excited by it. Or those YouTube videos of the deaf babies and suddenly they get their cochlear implants and they can hear their parents and they're so excited. Well, suddenly, when you realize that there are genres in the Old Testament, a lot of problems go away because you can read according to those genres and you go, oh, wait, this isn't this wasn't meant to be history. I don't have to. Um, my faith does not require me to pit this history against science. Because it wasn't intended as history to begin with. I've been misreading it. Um, imagine in 2000 years, uh, some Latter-day Saint decides to go back and read general conference talks from, you know, the 1990s and 2000s. And he sees, um, back in the 1990s, uh, the Simpsons got quoted several times. Uh, Harry Potter has been quoted a couple of times. Uh, the French novel Les Miserables uh, has been quoted several times. Does that mean that because those have been quoted in inspired places, that those are all histories? Should we read Harry Potter as a history because it was quoted in an inspired talk? No. So uh, let me briefly apply this to Genesis. If Genesis is the only creation account from the ancient Near East that you have read, and you are a modern person, in the 2020s, your instinct will be to read it as a history, as a, as a historical account of the material creation of the universe. And this is not what Genesis was trying to do. Those are not the truths it was trying to teach. Um, those are not the revelations that the Israelites needed. God spoke to them in their language, in their idiom, to borrow DNC 1 verse 24. Uh, and he took their conceptions of the universe to teach them the doctrinal truths that they needed, um, which had to do with the nature of the universe. Who runs the universe? Is it the God of Israel who loves humanity and created it for them? Or is it polytheistic gods who are at war with each other, who don't care about humans, that life is awful and then you die? Um, and to do that, God embedded those truths in the Israelites' understanding of the cosmos, which was a flat earth surrounded by a solid dome that kept the cosmic waters out, and there were cosmic waters underneath. For us to read Genesis as if it was intending to provide scientific details is to really misread it badly. It's to rest scripture, as Alma says. Um, we want to read scripture as if we were natives, and we're not. Uh, if you've ever traveled to a foreign land, you know that customs are different. 
even uh, if you have studied the language, there are things that you learn in speaking the language that you can't look up in a dictionary. And it's the same with Genesis. The, uh, Genesis doesn't explain things to us because it wasn't talking to us, it was talking to the Israelites. This is something I've talked about a lot, and I hope I'm doing it well in brief. But uh, once we understand the genre of Genesis, what it was trying to do and the truths it was trying to teach, a lot of the problems with evolution and conflicts with science go away. Um, and that is, uh, that is what I teach when I teach Institute, when I do firesides, I say, look, I, I'm not actually out here preaching evolution. I am not a scientist. I have a little training in science. I have training in history of science. But most of my training is in scripture and history. And when I read Genesis literally in Hebrew, it's not in conflict with science because it's not trying to be science. It's apples and oranges. Uh, here are the things that Genesis was actually teaching the Israelites and why they were important. And I spend two hours on this. Um, but once we understand that genre thing, a lot of the problems go away, and we are free to accept evolution. Hay, hay, hay una pregunta. ¿Qué crees que es lo que influenció a los estadounidenses en leer las escrituras de forma textual? ¿Fue la reforma? Fue, eh, ¿Viene por parte del protestantismo? ¿O, ¿O cuál es tu opinión en ese aspecto? What is your opinion on how the scriptures are read um, in the United States? Um, is it the reform or what do you, what is your intent? Yeah, literally. Um, so uh, the United States was founded as a heavily Protestant country and remains with very heavy, heavy Protestant influence. So much so that uh, my advisor has said that in the United States, even Islam and Hinduism take on shades and flavors of Protestantism, which it does not do outside the United States. Now, here's the thing about the restoration of the gospel. Um, those of us who have served missions know that when someone gets baptized, it's not like you wipe their mind blank and dump in the gospel in its purity, right? People bring in their past beliefs, their past assumptions, and slowly they learn and, and some things stay and some things go. In 1830, everyone was a convert, including Joseph Smith. Um, in Joseph Smith's town, there was a famous corner that had a church on every corner and all four of those churches were Protestant. There were hardly any Catholics around. And consequently, when Latter-day Saints in the 1800s read the Bible and Latter-day Saint scripture, they tended to read like 1800s Protestants. Um, and because, well, for a number of reasons, let's see. Yeah, let's do a little bit more of this. So as you may know, um, Protestants have this founding principle from Martin Luther and Calvin called sola scriptura. That is the Bible is the highest authority. It might not be the only authority, but it's the highest authority. Uh, for Catholics, like Latter-day Saints and Jews, scripture is not the highest authority. Um, for Jews, it is not what the Torah says, but how the rabbis interpret it that matters. For Catholics, it's not so much what the Bible says as much as what the magisterial authority of the church says scripture requires. For Latter-day Saints, we are not sola scriptura Protestants. Uh, we have living prophets who are kind of like the Supreme Court who interpret the law. The law is on the books, but the Supreme Court tells us how the law applies to us today and what it means. Protestants don't have that. And so Protestants eventually in the United States 
decided, well, if there is no authority, then how we read scripture really matters. And so we have to read it carefully. And so they put a lot of emphasis on uh, historical context and learning Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and uh, things like that. Because Latter-day Saints had living prophets, the source of scripture, we did not develop any of that. In fact, we had some strong rhetoric against it at some points that said, uh, not only is that not great, it's a bad idea. Don't go study that stuff. That will only lead you away from the true gospel. Um, and so Latter-day Saints kind of inherited this way of reading scripture in the 1800s. And because we had prophets, we thought we never needed anything else. Um, now, this is not to say that we don't have prophets. What it is to say is like President Nelson has said, good inspiration comes from good information. Well, what happens if you don't have good information? Uh, this might be controversial, but I would say when you don't have good information, you end up with the, the priesthood ban. We didn't have good history on it. You had general authorities in the early 1900s saying, well, we can't change this. That's revelation of Joseph Smith. We can't find any revelation of Joseph Smith on this. We have very good evidence of people like Joseph Smith ordaining black men to the priesthood. All the evidence we can find says this is Brigham Young in 1852. Tradition, in other words, tradition is not an infallible guide to truth. And there is a reason why the church today draws on scholars, draws on researchers. Um, I am the church's expert on the history of Latter-day Saints and evolution, and they have sent things to me to read and comment on. When Saints Volume 3 came out, which, I, which should be translated into Spanish, I think they tried to put them all out at the same time, they sent me two chapters dealing with the 1920s and 30s in science to read and comment on, and I sent them very blunt commentary that said, this isn't the best history, here's some other sources, here's what I think, and they rewrote it. Um, we have prophets, but that doesn't mean that good information only comes through prophets. Prophets also require information laterally from the best scholars the church has from cutting edge scientists from linguists from sociologists and they gather that information they counsel with it and they take it to the lord um that is how councils work that is why we have a council of the 12. that is why the president of the church has counselors because god doesn't just download this into the the president of the church's head um so tradition is not an infallible guide to truth. And I think the church history essays, uh, sorry, that's not what they're called. The, the long gospel topics essays on the translation of the Book of Mormon, on polygamy, on the Book of Abraham, on other things like that, those are the best information the church has. Uh, they're not revelation, but they're what the president of the church is willing to stand behind. Until we get better information, either from research or from revelation. Pero digamos que, por ejemplo, estos ensayos que ha publicado la iglesia, este, en el caso del tema de la evolución es bastante deficiente, tiene bastantes lagunas, y efectivamente, como no se presenta ni como doctrina, ni como posición oficial, queda una laguna de interpretación alrededor. It seems like there is a gap on the information or the read the written from the church um so what do you think in the in, specifically it, in the essay that the church wrote about evolution right yeah um church leaders move slowly and with good reason i think and what that means is we should move slowly. Um, I, well, let me draw a parallel example. And I use this a lot because I think it's really good. If we can go back to the New Testament that we've just been doing recently, you know, with Acts 9 and 10 and, and Paul, 
Paul's persecuting the saints. He is doing it because he has good scriptural reasons for doing so. Uh, he thinks a, a crucified Messiah makes no sense. And it doesn't, based on a Pharisaic reading of, of uh, Deuteronomy 21, 21 through 23. Um, Paul thought that anyone who had been crucified was under God's curse. And therefore, these people who are worshiping a crucified Messiah, this is blasphemous. And then Paul on the road to Damascus has Jesus appear to him. And Jesus says simply, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. After that, Paul knows two things. He knows that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. And he knows that a crucified Messiah is not compatible with what Scripture says. Jesus does not explain to him how to make these two mesh, how to make them make sense. Paul has to spend, I think, years trying to figure that out. And eventually he does. He does this in Galatians 3.13, which I can go into later if you want. But what that means for us is we're going to get revelation and we're going to get other information. And both may be true, but God leaves it to us to work through that and figure out how these how these make sense together. And sometimes it's going to be, you know what? We misunderstood our own scripture. We misunderstood our own history. Sometimes it's going to be, you know what? The current science was a little bit misleading and wrong. Sometimes it's going to be maybe something completely unpredictable. When Peter has his vision of Acts 10, of the cloth coming down with all the unkosher animals, I don't think he had been waiting for a revelation to open up the gospel to the Gentiles. He's pretty shocked by that. Uh, I, I think, I mean, if I don't think this will ever happen, but if you imagine President Nelson having a vision of God letting down a, a cloth with, uh, you know, cigarettes and beer in it and saying, you know, take, drink, he'd be like, no, Lord, no, what? No, this is, no. Um, but I, I think that's how it would have been felt by Peter. And notably, this change, not only does it require revelation to Peter as president of the church, but there's revelation to Cornelius, and they come together, and they have to use human logic and reasoning and talking it out to figure out exactly what this means. God does not hand over a new handbook. He doesn't hand over the details. He gives minimal revelation, and then it's up to these church leaders to figure it out. Um, in Acts 15, verse 28, after the Jerusalem Council, when they're talking about, okay, well, we have all these Gentile converts. Do they have to become Jews first? When they issue their ruling, which ultimately goes back to this revelation, but also all the counseling and things, they say something very interesting. And I hope that's the right reference, Acts 15, 28. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us. That is, this makes sense. This we think is the best thing, and we feel spiritual confirmation of it. It is both of those things. It is the heart and the mind together. It is human reason and revelation together. It is good information leading to good inspiration. And one of the problems in the church is we like to ignore the good information and just assume that it all comes down, you know, into the prophet's head and flows out from there nice and neat. And it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in scripture. It doesn't work that way in church history. Yo tengo otra pregunta. Eh, ¿Podrías explicar brevemente? Brevemente no. No es posible. Brevemente. <risa> Perfecto. Mejor aún. No, no puedo hacer. <risa> eh, ¿qué, es, ¿Qué se entiende por teoría en el mundo científico? Porque mucha gente he oído decir, ah, la teoría de la evolución es una, solo una teoría, no es una ley, no está comprobado, no es algo fijo. Y como que usa la palabra teoría eh, para desacreditar la evolución. ¿Podrías explicar un poco de eso? Sí. 
did you get the question? Can you? I, I, I do need that translated more fully. Okay. Okay. So how do you explain the word theory? Because that could be contradictory to history or. I, I, I have I have heard some people saying like, you know, like, oh, that's just a theory. You don't have to believe right. in that. Like it can be like change and they can be wrong. It's just like a guess. They use that word like if it was just like a guess. And I know that it's right. different in the scientific uh, field. Yeah, the, the problem is that theory is a word that has two very different meanings depending on the context. Scientists tend to use it one way and it tends to get used popularly as if it's equivalent to a guess, a hypothesis, just an idea. But for scientists, a theory and a hypothesis or a guess are very different things. A theory is something that is very strong. A theory unifies all kinds of data and it allows the making of predictions. It is testable. Um, and so evolution is called a theory because it unifies data across a dozen different scientific fields and because it allows scientists to make testable hypotheses that then for the most part happen. Um, whether that is predictions of, if we, if we tweak this and this in an animal and let it go 10,000 generations like they do with fruit flies, what's gonna happen? But it also allows them to predict, we should be able to find certain kinds of fossils and then they find those. Now this does not mean that uh, evolution has no holes in it. Every scientific theory has holes in it. It has problems. Um, the way scientific theories and paradigms work is a theory unifies data. And as you generate more and more data, either that data continues to support the theory or more and more data starts to pile up that this theory can't make sense of. And when that pile gets big enough, someone proposes a new theory that can encompass all of this other data. In other words, evolution is a very strong theory because it accounts for almost all the data there is. Um, there are still bits and pieces that we don't understand and can't figure out for People who are theologically committed to, say, a young Earth, which does not allow enough time for evolution, they look at those holes and they say, aha, you can't explain everything, therefore the whole thing is wrong. And scientists say, no, that hole is not big enough to overturn the entire thing. It's not significant enough to overturn the entire thing. We have this mountain of data that supports the theory of evolution, and those two little bits of data that don't fit. Um, so calling evolution a theory is says something very different to scientists than it does to lay people. And that's very unfortunate. Uh, gravity is a theory, for example. Um, and my understanding is that scientists will distinguish between a theory and a law in the sense that a law can be described mathematically. Uh, you know, you can look up the law of gravity and it's gravity equals mass one times mass two over the gravitational constant. That's the law of gravity. The theory of gravity is the explanation behind that mathematical thing. Um, now, I am not enough of a scientist to know if there is math involved in evolution. I know there are population genetics and, and things like that, but that's that's not my area anymore. So calling evolution a theory doesn't undermine it. It actually says it's a very, very strong thing. Eh, ¿Qué piensas de los miembros de la iglesia que afirman decir que creen solo en la eh, microevolución y no en la macroevolución? Eh, es decir, que solo creen en los pequeños cambios o variaciones de una especie, pero no en los cambios grandes de, por ejemplo, de que el hombre desciende de otras especies. Well, uh, so that I think I understood. Um, 
if you ask a biologist, there's no difference between microevolution and macroevolution, except how many generations you're looking at. Um, to make that kind of distinction is to almost be ignorant of the way evolution and biology function. Uh, to my knowledge, trained biologists do not even use those terms. Those are terms that were uh, originated by creationists who wanted to say, well, of course, there are little variants. Um, but it is exactly those little variants if you multiply them by four billion years and who knows how many trillions of generations result in big differences. Uh, if you look at the history of creationism, a lot of times the rhetoric was very populist. It was a monkey never gives birth to a human. And a biologist would say, that's absolutely true, but that's not what evolution claims. Evolution doesn't claim that a cat will give birth to a dog or a dog will give birth to a wolf. But if you take little changes and multiply those by 10 million, you're going to get significant divergences that give you speciation, different groups. Um, macroevolution is just microevolution over billions of years. Bueno, eh, sabemos que estás en tu tesis de doctorado actualmente. ¿Cómo vas? Este, ¿Qué lecturas nos recomiendas aquí para los nosotros, para los que te están escuchando? Eh, podcast. What's your uh, how's your dissertation going on the doctorates and, and um, any readings that you would recommend? So, uh, I, uh, unless there are major surprises, I will defend my dissertation in fall and receive my doctorate, um, which we are all very excited about, especially my wife. Um, most of the readings that I would recommend are in English. And I, I think this is actually a big problem for the church. Um, in English, we have all kinds of materials coming out of BYU. We have all kinds of unorthodox materials. We have all kinds of materials in between. We have the Journal of Mormon History and the Mormon History Association. We have the Maxwell Institute and the Interpreter Foundation. But if you speak Spanish or Italian or Mandarin or Russian, you don't have access to any of this stuff. Um, and so your understanding of church history and doctrine is limited to official materials, which as we've seen can sometimes Quite not like reflect that. the actual true tradition of the church. Now, I think we're doing much better now than we were in the 1980s um, with that manual, but that's still the case. Um, so let me, let me point first of all to Saints chapter three, uh, Saints volume three chapters 20 and 21, I think. There, there are some paragraphs in there about the church and science in the 1920s and 30s, and I know that exists in Spanish. I think those two short articles from the New Era in 2016 are available in Spanish. What does the church teach about dinosaurs? What does the church teach about evolution? And if not, they are short enough that they should be very quickly translatable and they can be put side by side with the English. It's not complicated language. Um, now I am familiar with the website MOSFE and uh, I have been in touch with them and they have a list of my blog posts that they were going to translate into Spanish and post. Uh, as of yesterday, they have told me again that they are translating them to post, but it's been almost a year. Uh, and so I, every couple of months I say, hey guys, what's going on? Um, <laughs> if you want, we can do it in, Juan has a blog, it's called well, I think, Translator. I think he has done one or two. Yep. Um, beyond that, sí, I de, don't... De hecho, yo te traduje algunos este, entradas de tu blog que me pediste y te las envíe a tu chat 
Do you hear that? He translated a couple already, sent them to you to uh, be checked yeah. out by you. Okay. Well, I have, uh, my brother-in-law is a Spanish professor who lived in Mexico for 10 years. So he's quite fluent in both. And I think I will have him look at them just to make sure that my English was understood and the Spanish is reflecting that and so on. Um, there is a lot of good material in English. But I, I just, I don't know what's available in Spanish. Si That's very unfortunate. Las recomendaciones en inglés. La hoja still... del olivo surgió como precisamente para eso, para dar a conocer estos temas que son desconocidos en el mundo de habla hispana y que solo están en inglés. So we still like to know some recommendations for you, you know, in, in, even if they are in English, because la hoja del olivo uh, was made for that to give uh, information um, that is not known in Spanish. So okay, um, I think uh, let's see. You held up your copy of B. H. Roberts' book earlier. Is that the Signature Books version or the BYU Studies version? Because there are there are two versions by two different publishers. The BYU Studies version has a great article by James B. Allen called. The story of the truth, the way, and the life. Um, and BYU studies is unimpeachably orthodox. James Allen was an LDS historian who worked for the church. That gives a good overview of the 1930-31 debates. Um, in January, this coming January, January 2024, BYU Studies will put out a special issue dedicated to the question of evolution and LDS faith. Uh, we have several articles in there by scientists, but we also have a number by LDS historians and BYU religion professors, uh, including a long one by me on the two first presidency statements in 1909 and 1925 and 1930 and 31. Um, I would recommend translating those when they come out, because again, that's BYU Studies. BYU Studies is an approved source for use in seminary and institute. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen um, on the church's website, there is a page that is called something like uh, approved third party sources. And it says, um, these are not sources published directly by the church. They don't go through correlation. But we, so we're, we're not saying they're official or doctrinal, but we approve them for use in seminary and institute and as resources. And that's things like BYU Studies. It is the journal called Religious Educator that comes out of uh, the BYU Religious Studies Center. It is the Maxwell Institute, it is the Interpreter Foundation, and some other things. So once it's in BYU Studies, it's a very legitimate, orthodox, approved source for use in seminaries and institutes. So I would look for that when it comes out in January. Last I was told it's due in January. It's a big issue. It's very big. Um, some of my uh, FAIR talks, uh, I have spoken at FAIR several times on the related questions of how should we interpret Genesis? Um, how do we make sense of having different creation accounts in Genesis, Moses, Abraham, and the temple? Uh, and how does that relate to things like the Joseph Smith translation and our assumptions about the nature of revelation and prophets and things like that? Those are very good sources. FAIR is also on that list of approved for seminary and institute to read and translate. Um, let's see. Sí, su presentación de, de FAIR sobre, sobre este tema está traducido al español y está disponible para nuestros escuchas. Your translation of the, what was it? Juan, uh, it's, it's been Fair already talk. translated, yeah, to Spanish, so that, that is available for uh, those who follow uh, La Hoja del Olivo. Yeah. 
Um, lastly, and this is more general, um, sometime in the last year or two, there was a BYU professor of evolutionary biology named Jamie Jensen, who gave the Tuesday devotional, which was all about science and religion. Uh, Jamie is a friend of mine. She is one of the co-editors of that special BYU studies issue. But that, that BYU devotional by Jamie Jensen is probably a very good thing. Um, Jamie does a lot of work not only on evolutionary biology itself, but also on teaching evolutionary biology and what helps highly religious students accept human evolution. And she, she writes about that a lot. Um, so that's probably a good one. Also unimpeachably orthodox. Um, oh, uh, there is, um, I don't know if these get translated. The volumes of saints have a series of short historical background essays. Uh, these are called historical topics or something like that. They, uh, in the online version in English, these are linked. So it might be someone's name or an event, and you can click on it and it takes you to a short essay. They did one for saints on evolution. I would look into translating that. In fact, I may be able to send you the link to that if you can't find it. That's only a couple of paragraphs long. That is one of those things that they sent me to review as an outside expert, and I gave them my commentary, and now it's published. But that is the most recent thing that the church has said about evolution in connection with saints. Um, so that's, uh, that's a good bit. I do want to add a little bit more history. Um, I, I've mentioned some evolutionary biology professors at BYU. BYU has been teaching evolution positively in connection with the gospel in science classes since the 1920s. They've been teaching it for 100 years. And uh, they have produced a lot of very good scientists. Um, now, while they were teaching evolution in the 1920s, it was integrated into other courses. It wasn't until 1971 that they actually started teaching courses with evolution in the name that were dedicated to evolution. And when that happened, there was something very unusual. Other departments complained and they said, you can't do that. You can't teach evolution. And so what they did is they took it all the way up to the president of the church, who was Joseph Fielding Smith. And Joseph Fielding Smith said, they can teach evolution. They are authorized to teach evolution. I authorize them to teach evolution. And they did it again. And this time it went to Harold B. Lee. And Harold B. Lee said, yes, they can teach evolution as long as they don't beat the church with it like a stick. They are authorized to be teaching evolution. So here, evolution's been taught at the church's university for a long time, and that teaching is fully approved even by Joseph Fielding Smith. He disagrees with the science, but he wanted it taught. BYU has a dinosaur museum too. Sí, y por supuesto no dejamos de recomendar su blog benspackman.com donde pueden tratar y revisar estos temas con bastante mayor amplitud y donde encontrarán seguramente muchas de las fuentes que él nos ha comentado y, y agradecemos esta oportunidad que hemos tenido contigo Ben de poder aprender de ti y especialmente que puedas dirigirte al mundo de habla hispana muchas gracias y agradecemos tu participación en este episodio de la hoja del olivo no sé si alguien más quiere comentar algo. Sí. Thank you so much, Ben, for everything and your participation today. Um, yeah, and asking if there is more comments or Thank questions you. before wrapping up. Well, I, I always have more, but this is probably already a lot. <laughs>
It's fine. Muchas gracias, Ben, por este tiempo que nos has dado para el mundo latino. Fue un gusto conocerte y esperemos que después de tu defensa, de tu tesis de doctorado, podamos tenerte nuevamente para que nos eh, deleites nuevamente con, tu, con tus nuevos estudios y las nuevas cosas que tienes para nosotros. Gracias, Ben. Thank you so much for your participation today, and we hope after you um after you are done with your doctorate, then you can share more information, newest information with La Hoja del Olivo and their followers. Muchas gracias a vosotros también. Estoy muy feliz a hablar.